On Wednesday, the House of Representatives is expected to take up a motion to disapprove the president's request last month to extend most favored nation trading status to the People's Republic of China. Each bill that comes to the House floor must pass through the Rules Committee, which decides debate time, amendments to be offered, and other legislative guidelines for consideration. Coming up next, we bring you today's Rules Committee proceedings, which sets up the parameters for debate on the disapproval resolution. The chairman of the Rules Committee is Congressman Joseph Moakley, Democrat of Massachusetts. The Rules Committee will now come to order. There's been a request to have this televised or any objection. Chair has none. Will be allowed. Uh, today, the committee meets to report a rule for three measures regarding the most favored nation status for China. Uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Solomon's joint resolution disapproving the extension of the FMN, MFN for this year. Ms. Pelosi's bill setting conditions on next year's extension of the MFN status. And Mr. Solar's concurrent resolution urging China not to pursue policies that end, undermine the United States' interests. Uh, Mr. Gibbons, you want to take your place here? Chairman, members of the committee, I think you know I'm here substituting for Mr. Rostenkowski, who is out of town today. And uh, Some people don't feel that's a substitute. You're being here. They, oh, well, they I think it's you. a substitute, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rostenkowski has done an excellent job as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I, uh, have had it. I have enjoyed working with him. I have learned a lot from his uh, his tutorage. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, there are two, three bills. Three bills. Uh -huh. There is a Solomon bill, there is a Pelosi bill, and there is a Solars bill. Uh, the Solomon bill comes up under law. Uh, we chose his uh, because he was one of the first to introduce it. It uh, is on a fast track. Uh, it uh, is unamendable under the law, and we'd ask you to keep it that way. And uh, it goes through the Senate at the, roughly the same time, and then to the President. The Pelosi bill is not on a fast track. It, is, has, it was amended in the Ways and Means Committee, and we would ask you to either include those amendments as original text or to permit us to present them in block. Uh, and uh, the Solars bill is uh, mainly in the jurisdiction of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, somebody told me that they perhaps did not want to present it at this time. Uh, if they want to present it, that's fine. We approved it in, in the Ways and Means Committee. A part of it was in, was, was in our jurisdiction. Uh, so that's uh, what it's all about, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we would ask for a closed rule on Pelosi, other than those committee amendments. I think the committee just about exhausted all the amendments you could think of anyway. Uh, and uh, it, uh, as I say, it's got a long track between here and the Senate and the conference, and then finally to the President. I'd be glad to answer questions. Mr. Gibbons, as you all know, that the Solomon Amendment, uh, the disapproval resolution uh, under the Trade Act, a disapproval resolution, yes, sir, uh, is subject to 20 hours of debate. We, we don't want that uh, much. We'd ask for an hour. An if hour of Mr. debate. Mr. Solomon wants I think more. That's, I think that's a good. Uh, Middle ground. Yes. <laughs> Good. And we'd ask for an hour on Pelosi. Uh, we don't want to cut off debate, but uh, All right. I think most members of An hour on each of the amendments you feel would be fine? On, on each of the bills. On each of the bills, right. Yes. I, I think we can adopt the amendments in block. Uh, yeah. If that's agreeable with the okay. committee. Would, would the chairman yield? Uh, uh, glad to yeah. yield to uh, the ranking minority member. I just, uh, Sam, first of all, I want to thank you for reporting my bill, uh, even though it was reported without recommendation. Yes. It's the same as you did last year, and uh, I, I do appreciate it. 
Uh, and certainly, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, my bill, which uh, just unilaterally cuts off uh, most favored nation treatment for China, uh, there isn't that much to debate. We all know the issue, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly I think one hour is, is sufficient. Uh, when we get into the Pelosi bill, uh, which does have uh, four or five um, uh, substantive amendments attached to it, uh, I guess Mrs. Pelosi uh, is going to be here. I am also a, a co-sponsor of yes. her legislation, and I intend to support both my bill and her bill so that we can send them in tandem to the Senate. But um, uh, there is an unusual request uh, from you and uh, Chairman Rostenkowski that would uh, not give us the marked up bill, but would give us the original Pelosi text and then have the amendments adopted in your committee uh, considered in block, and I uh, I don't know, but what that might require more debate time uh, for those people uh, who had who had introduced those amendments and uh, who may be opposed or in favor of them. Uh, if uh, Mrs. Pelosi were to come in and uh, request it, uh, do you think it would be fair to perhaps give an extra hour of debate uh, to the Pelosi? Uh, one hour, uh, which would allow them to discuss those those four or five substantive amendments. Uh, well, go ahead. I think the amendment's going to be adopted anyway, uh, and uh, I just don't want to delay the time of the House. Uh, you know, that's your function, though, Mr. Solomon. Uh, well, uh, even with one hour on Pelosi, the whole the whole matter is going to take about five hours anyway. So it's not going You've to be got an hour on the rule, plus an hour on each, your bill, each of the plus bills. an hour on Pelosi, plus m maybe a, uh, an hour of general and an hour, an hour of general, general debate yeah, too. Right. Just about it's five hours. Yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of time in there. Four hours. Yeah, plus we, the, the Mr. Archer had a substitute. Mr. Chairman, that he presented and lost by a narrow vote. And when the committee voted on the type of rule we would recommend to you, uh, we uh, said if Mr. Archer presents his amendment, wants to present his amendment, we'd recommend an hour on that. So we, we felt like we were loading you up with a lot of debate. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. Archer is going to present a substitute. I had heard uh, through the staff that he was not going to present a but so, you're satisfied with one hour uh, yes, general sir. debate, that's, one hour on the fine. rule, one hour on the bills? It's a pretty cut and dried situation, Mr. Chairman. I think, you know, everybody pretty much made up their mind how they're going to vote. So, thank you. Any questions? I have no questions. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, any questions, David? Mr. Chairman, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, and it's uh, great to be uh, supporting once again an issue on which uh, we uh, share our same position and. Uh, and I, uh, like you, feel very strongly and congratulate you for your leadership on this issue that you've shown for the uh, years that you've served here in the House. Thank you. I had the opportunity to do a couple of things. I, I watched uh, part of the proceedings of the Ways and Means Committee's hearings on these. And, and at the end of the uh, meeting, Dick Schultz uh, made the point that there is a maximum of 20 hours of debate called for for this resolution of disapproval. And, and uh, at that time, uh, an outline was, was uh, provided stating that, yes, there'd be an hour of debate on the rule, an hour of general debate, an hour of debate on Solomon, an hour's debate on Pelosi, and then an hour on Archer. And I remember that Dick Schultz raised a point that with the 20-hour provision, it seemed that possibly under general debate or under the uh, resolution of disapproval that Mr. Solomon has, as is called for in the law, that 20 hours would be in order. This morning, I listened to one-minute speeches down on the floor. I saw Glenn Anderson, Bill Barrett, a wide range of people stand up and talk about this issue. And you're right in stating that, that uh, we here uh, in, the, in the House have, for the most part, made up our minds on the issue. But it seems to me that there are a lot of members who are going to want to, to uh, utilize this. And since you in the 1974 uh, trade law put into place this 20-hour provision, it seems to me that under general debate to only have 5% of that uh, is a little extreme and that maybe if we went to 10%, which would just be an additional hour, putting it to two hours of general debate or two hours under Solomon, 
seems to me that that would be a little fair, especially in light of the fact that that the hour that would have been in line for the Archer Amendment, as it had been considered from the beginning, is is not going to be there. Well, you know, that's your function. You can allocate the time. Uh, we were just trying to expedite the work of the House. We think most members' minds have, have already been made up. Uh, I can tell you in 1974, when we put the 20 hours of debate in it, we gave it about 15 seconds worth of thought. Uh, well, how did you come deep to and concentrated in that time, uh, uh, and that picked 20 hours out of the thin air. Uh, no one's ever tried to use the 20 hours. Um, so in other words, it, it could have been 40 hours then? It could have been 40, or it could have been 15, or 10, or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. We were just, uh, we were grappling with other problems and really weren't concentrating on the debate. Well, I, you know, I, I noticed in the committee debate as you went through this that this issue of, uh, of Archer was part of it, and I think the point that was made by a number of people is, yeah, there's going to be an hour to consider the rule and an hour to consider all these other items, and maybe since there's been withdrawal of one of them, putting that hour back in might be fair to uh, those members of the House who are not on the Ways and Means Committee or not on this committee able to get involved in it. We're not going to quibble with you on that. Uh, you, you let me, let me ask you this time. question then, Sam. Do you think that uh, adding an hour will in any way affect the outcome? Would the gentleman yield? Happy to yield to the distinguished uh, leader. <laughs> if I might, just uh, even though the administration is on the other side from me, if I might submit their uh, their position uh, I'll do it against the side. I would have been happy to do it. I would have been happy to do it. Without objection. Uh, uh, continue with the gentleman yield. Sam, uh, you know, it isn't just a question of Jackson Vanek. Yeah. And, and those of us feeling that, right. uh, that the People's Republic of China is in violation of Jackson Vanek, which means free immigration, uh, immigration of the uh, of the Chinese people. But you know, back in uh, in 1980, when uh, we first gave most favored nation treatment for China, you were here, I was here, yeah. you voted for it, and I voted against it back in 1980. But um, uh, we we set up trade policy at that time with the People's Republic of China. And it seems to me we need to revisit that whole area. And that's your subcommittee and yes. your jurisdiction. And you do such an excellent job uh, all over the world. And I have to commend you for it. But as I've told the President Bush, uh, uh, back in 1980, uh, we set up bilateral trade agreements that provided that the United States and China would not discriminate against each other, against their, each other's imports and exports. And secondly, uh, committed each nation to protect the patents, trademarks, copyrights, and industrial rights of the other nation. And, you know, we have all kinds of problems. Here's a New York Times article. There was one in the Los Angeles Times not too long ago that points out the, uh, the trade wars that uh, China has learned, guerrilla tactics. And I think we have problems beyond just Jackson Vatic. And I think that's what the gentleman from California is alluding to, that uh, we need to air this on the floor so that the American people become aware, too. And I think um, asking for one more hour, I don't think, is, uh, is unreasonable. Oh, we're not going to quibble with you on that. And, and uh, I, I would say that we have a lot of trouble with China. It's a huge nation. One out of every five people on Earth live in a narrow coastal plain in China. And they are all have one characteristic. They're all poor. Uh, they're all at a very marginal level of subsistence. And uh, they've got deep social, economic, and political problems. And I would not uh, condone their actions. I can only say this, that if they're bad now, they were terrible then. They have improved some. Uh, they've got a lot more improvement to do. And uh, I, I don't uh, have any objection at all to airing the whole China case. I just was suggesting that perhaps uh, to expedite the business of the House, we don't need to talk it to death. That's all. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sam, this request for the adoption of the amendments in block, uh, that, is that permissive, or does it say that there will only be one vote on all of them? Well, if we adopt them in block, it'll just be one vote on all of them. Uh, are, are you requesting permission to consider them in block, and therefore the option could still be left on the floor, or are you requesting the rule be written such that there will only be one vote on all of we them? We would like you to write the rule to include them as a part of the original text. If you don't want to do that, we would like you to let us present them in block. 
All right. Uh, All right. One other question. I, I don't think, you know, I think the proponents of those amendments are just about synonymous. Mr. Each Chairman, one are about the same. We're going to allow you to present them on the floor and block. All right, fine. That's okay right. with us. Fine. Has there been any discussion, Sam, this whole idea of most favored nation, which includes virtually everyone except the number of nations you can count on one hand, uh, is, is there discussion in the Ways and Means Committee about a possibility of another title? Uh, for the <laughs> yes, there has been. In fact, back in 1974, we tried to change the name of it. Uh, to non-discriminatory tariff treatment. We should have come up with a shorter name than that because that's what most favored nation is. But uh, it seems that uh, in the parliamentary lingo, not only in the United States but around the world, most favored nation is uh, this is what we call it. Uh, it um, is non-discriminatory tariff treatment, but nobody will say non-discriminatory tariff treatment. They just say most favored nation. It's, it's a habit. It's, it's, it's like a lot of things in life. It's a misnomer, as all of us know. Uh, but um, if you can come up with a quicker name and sell it to five billion people, uh, <laughs> I'll endorse it. I appreciate it. I would say in response to that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that it seems that uh, in your area of trade, we have a wide range of these misnomers. We do. Fast track we was do. a great right. misnomer that we had, and we debated that thing earlier this year. Yes, that's right. Why can't you change all of them? <laughs> well, I would like to. Uh, <laughs> you might use all those 20 hours if you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's difficult, uh, it's difficult it, it, to it's, communicate to the American people as to why yeah. people who run their tanks and over bodies and bicycles should now be given most favored nation. And that, it, it seems to me right. to be well, non sequitur. We, we, we give most favored nation to, to Iraq still. Yeah. And to lots Iraq, of other Iraq, Iraq still has post favored nations. Oh, oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, have, we, we have tried to do it, and, and you, the president was against it one time. <laughs> <laughs> so they have non-discriminatory trade status. Well, we only really only import oil from them, you see, and I don't no. think yeah. we want to increase the tariff on oil that much or their oil that much. So, so uh, am, am I judging from your response? You would oppose taking away most favored nation status from Iraq. I haven't even thought about it. Okay, I thought that's all we, all we import because we can make it, we, we can add it Iraq. to this under all, this rule it could be added. All, all, all that we import from oil is right. from Iraq is oil, and it's just a matter we could attack that problem in a number of different ways. But uh, we're not importing anything from them now, and they're they're not exporting anything to the rest of the world. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we, we've, uh, we, we have a de facto. So answer your question. Adding another nation to this bill would be non-germane. It would be a tough time getting through a rules committee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you very much. The Honorable Donald Pease of Ohio. Uh, Congressman, you're going to speak on H.J. Res 263, 2212, and 174. You'll address all three at the same time? Or uh, do you yes, wanna... Mr. Chairman, if that's satisfactory. Fine. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I don't have a different perspective. As you know, I've been very interested in this uh, area of uh, MFN for China. <clears throat> I sought permission to testify in case a different view was needed, but I fully subscribe to the uh, request of Mr. Gibbons. I'd like to associate myself with his remarks. <clears throat> Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. I might uh, just say, uh, for the benefit of Mr. McEwen and Mr. Dreyer, that <clears throat> uh, when we tried to fashion in, in committee the amendments uh, to this bill, uh, Congressman Solars. Mrs. Pelosi and I worked uh, together, and our idea was to keep the amendments fairly narrow <clears throat> so that the uh, Chinese could meet the conditions because we did not want to cut off MFN for China, and also <clears throat> so that the White House might possibly sign the bill. And uh, in committee, because there are a lot of other concerns, additional amendments that were offered, the Committee Ways and Means Committee is now asking that all those be considered in block. I think we all know what the outcome would be if we consider them separately on the floor. There's no sense in, in taking the time of the, of the House to do that. <clears throat> so I fully support all three measures, commend my colleague uh, Mrs. Pelosi for her leadership in this area. Thank you for the opportunity. Any to questions to the Congressman? Any questions? 
Mr. Chairman, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just want to commend the gentleman. I know he's been uh, in the forefront on this issue for a long time, and uh, it's uh, such it is a complex issue. Uh, I just don't quite understand uh, why in the committee process, uh, when your committee has marked up the bill, as we used to do on foreign affairs, uh, when the bill comes before the Rules Committee, it, it is the marked up version. What, what, what is different and what are the strategies that, that ask us to consider those amendments in block as instead of original text? They, if they were original text, they wouldn't be uh, considered individually either. Yeah. Mr. Solomon, I don't really know the answer to that question. <clears throat> uh, there are some rules that require that. I'm not aware of them, but uh, that was a decision that I did not participate in. I just wondered if there was some. Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to continue my uh, uh, line about the uh, the time that we're considering this on the floor. And I know that, that uh, you were there, Don, when this issue was debated as to how much time would be granted on the floor for members. And I keep looking at this 20 hours, and while it may have been established over uh, 15 seconds of consideration, it still is the maximum amount of time that's there. And I wondered if you have any thoughts about having an additional hour of general debate. I would uh, join Mr. Gibbons in saying that that's a decision for the Rules Committee to make. To, I don't think there's a strong feeling about it in ways and means. Well, you're right that it's a decision for us to make, except that you all have made a specific request from your committee as to how you want us to fashion the rule, and that's the reason that I'm asking for your thoughts on this. My, uh, my thoughts generally are that <clears throat> I support what Chairman Rostenkowski would like to have done, mm -hmm. and I think uh, he's suggesting an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we handle things the same way here in the Rules Committee. So. <laughs> Very democratic body. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pease. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Ms. Pelosi. It's a pleasure to welcome you and I congratulate you for the outstanding work you've done on this matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It is a pleasure to be here today because this legislation is the culmination of a great deal of work, really over a couple of years, and with our Congressional Working Group on China, of which some members of this committee have, in which some of the members of this committee have participated. Uh, so it's a it's a joy really to see this come uh, before the House of Representatives and make its official stop here at the Rules Committee. Uh, I support the uh, Ways and Means Committee's request for a modified closed rule uh, for the following reason. Uh, when, the, when we crafted our legislation, we crafted it with the idea that we want the relationship with China to continue. It's a country that we recognize we have a brilliant future with. However, we had to take a stand uh, on human rights and the treatment, basic freedoms which are denied to people in China and without going into all that happened at Tiananmen Square, which is well known to everyone here. So we try to, to place reasonable, doable conditions uh, on the renewal of most favored nation status for 1992. Renew it now with conditions for further renewal in 1992. With that in mind, any additional amendments which would up the ante might subtract from our effectiveness. We believe that because of the trade deficit that, the United, that China enjoys with the United States, they have a surplus with us, that is to say, could be $15 billion this year. Why shouldn't we use that for leverage to have the, uh, the prisoners who, who are there for political reasons freed? I think it's worth a chance. Therefore, we have reason to believe that these conditions that are in the original uh, bill, H.R. 2212, are those that can be achieved by the Chinese government, that we can continue most favored nation status with China in 1992, but in a relationship that is based on principle rather than one that ignores the fact that people demonstrated uh, for democracy, responded to our message of freedom over Voice of America and in every way that is transmitted from our country, and yet we chose to say that that was irrelevant to our economic relationship with China. Uh, I do, would like to, if, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, just address um, Mr. McEwen's uh, question about what is it called most favored nation when we have it with so many countries. And I would uh, just like to make this one point there, and that is we have most favored nation status with countries in the GATT. We don't have most favored nation status automatically with centralized economies. Centralized economies are not in the GATT. And, the, uh, and we have, as you know, with the Soviet Union, 
uh, law that said the Jackson Vanek, which is, which is part of the Most Favored Nation Law, but is most recently applied to the Soviet Union because of freedom of emigration. And when that is codified, then and only then would the Soviet Union be allowed as a centralized economy to have most favored nation status. I think it's important to remember we have it with most countries. It is not automatic, and it is certainly uh, a waiver is not automatic with a centralized economy. As far as Iraq is concerned, we have sanctions on Iraq. So uh, it's not germane to the. It's not germane, but but I don't want people to think well we give it to Iraq and we don't we want to withhold it from China. We have sanctions on Iraq. We don't trade with them at all. Uh, we did have most favored nation status uh, with uh, Iraq, much to the dismay of many of us in this room who fought that status for Iraq. Uh, but they don't have a more preferential trade treatment uh, than China does at this time. So because of the work that has gone into making doable, achievable conditions, uh, I hope that the committee will consider a modified closed rule so that the conditions are not for even further expanded than, than, we are, than they are now. You've probably heard the uh not debate, but the questioning of whether it should be one hour or two hours debate on your bill. Uh, what is your personal pleasure? Well, I support the committee's recommendation, the Ways and Means Committee's recommendation to the uh, request, one hour. excuse me, uh, to the committee. Uh, but I would like to invite any and all who would like to participate in the debate to join me in a special order this evening if there are further uh, comments that people would like to make on this subject. We do have other opportunities in the special order in the one minutes tomorrow. But I do believe that with the rule and the general debate and uh, the uh, Solomon bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, point of information, what do you have, how much time do you have for the on block amendments? Is there any special time given to those? No. I'm sure they won't take more than 20 minutes. If, uh, would the chairman yield? <clears throat> yeah, that, that wouldn't be any special time allotted for them. Yes, Ms. If the chairman would yield. Nancy, my, uh, my, my problem is, first of all, um, uh, our Republican leader has asked for an open rule uh, on the Pelosi bill. And uh, uh, if we don't get it, we'll have to oppose the rule. But. Uh, my well, we, we can even it out. We can change the statute <laughs> and open the Solomon for an open rule. Now, let's don't go too far here. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I mean, let's be open if we, we want to be open. We have to obey the law, and the law says you can't open the Solomon Amendment. The Rules but, Committee uh, can change that. You know that. <laughs> well, I forgot. They can do anything. Well. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> let, let me get on to the point. Nancy, the, uh, they are allowing one hour uh, of general debate on the rule. Mm -hmm. They are then allowing one hour of general debate on the uh, Solomon and Pelosi bill, Together. absent absent uh, Solars. One hour each? One hour. No, they're allowing one hour wow. of general debate on the two bills combined. Then there will be one hour on the Solomon uh, resolution, and there will be a vote taken. Then there will be one hour on the Pelosi bill and a vote taken, with no uh, separate debate time for the in block amendments. Uh, that raises some concern to a number of us, uh, uh, both pro and con, uh, that want to uh, uh, be able to, uh, to debate the issue thoroughly. For instance, uh, uh, Mr. John Miller, who couldn't be with us today from the state of Washington, uh, who is very much concerned with trade, as are you people from California and other states, uh, he wants very much to have an amendment made in order dealing with the Sullivan principle concept being applied to China. Uh, and issues like that ought to be debated. The, the uh, non-proliferation of, uh, uh, of uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, is a very major issue. And uh, I felt that we should either have two hours of general debate on the Pelosi bill, or we should have one hour of general debate on the Pelosi bill and one hour of time allocated for the in-block amendment so that uh, those proponents and opponents could have their, uh, their, their input. Otherwise, it gets so uh, involved in the emotional issue of the one-hour debate on your bill or the one-hour debate on my bill. And it would seem to be only fair if we are conceding uh, not to have anywhere near 20 hours of debate on the Solomon motion to disapprove, that we ought to be at least allowed two hours of general debate on yours, which is a more complex issue. 
and we would appreciate your support on it uh, uh, for the extra hour. I know that you're in a little bit of a position here, which... Uh, well, let me say my position springs from the, the following point, and that is that I have heard from those who oppose any conditions uh, on renewal, those who want unconditional renewal of most favored nation status for China, that, that their position is load up the bill and sink it. So I basically want to, I think we have to be discerning and, and, and careful about how we proceed so that what conditions we put there, we know why they're there, they're for a reason, they're not there to sink the bill and therefore deprive us of any hope whatsoever of using our leverage uh, to free the political prisoners in China. Uh, so I would, uh, you know, obviously the discretion is with this committee, but I would hope that whatever decision is made is made in furtherance of the goal of freeing the prisoners, not loading up the bill. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, not having been here for the beginning of it, although Mr. Solomon has given a very clear uh, description of what the, the choices are, uh, I, you know, I urge you to, to work but in favor of us getting a reasonable bill passed and one that is not uh, in the interest of killing the bill loaded up by its opponents it, it, with the illusion that they are supporting it. You wouldn't be adverse to getting an extra hour of general debate then if, if we're going to uh, appease some people no, in the process. I would not be averse to that, especially if it's suggested by Mr. Solomon, who's been a real champion on democracy in China issues and uh, uh, helping those who've spoken out for reform. Uh, and really, having said that, I'd like to say that the House of Representatives has been the bastion of support for democracy in China. None of that expression of support would be possible without the support of this committee. And whether it was protecting Chinese students in America or last year bringing most favored nation status conditions to the floor or this legislation today, uh, this committee has been a friend uh, to that cause and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Mr. Derrick. Explain to me what the abortion provision is in your own bill. Well, uh, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Derrick, I don't have uh, an abortion provision but in my bill, but, in but there is a, uh, um, a provision. Okay. The background of that is as follows. Um, uh, the uh, China has a, a, a policy of <laughs> coercive abortion, one family, one child. Uh, I believe that the uh, language in the bill regarding that is not a set up as an absolute condition that they must stop that policy in order to get most favored nation status. I think it's just language in there that that uh, refers to it. Uh, I don't have a copy of it. It's, to, to well, that's all right. You don't have to get a copy. But I, you have I, a copy I, just, of it. I just fail to see what that has to do with the uh, favored nation status. Well, I mean, as I, I, I said, my I preference. I don't understand why we put something like that in. in I mean, I, I, I mean, it just no, is there anyone that really believes that it is going to affect the policy of the Chinese government? Uh, I think you would have to ask uh, Mr. Moody, who's the author of the amendment. But I will say that Mr. Moody cooperated to one extent in that it is not presented really as a conditional condition for renewal of most favored nation status because that would be an insurmountable and not a doable condition and would not do anything, I think, to free uh, the prisoners whom we're trying to free. Uh, so I share your concern about it. My preference, of course, would be the Pelosi bill unamended. And mine as well. Thank <laughs> and, you very And that much. may be what we end up with. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Um, and Nancy, let me uh, really and sincerely commend you for all you've done in this effort. If the, if the people um, in China ever do uh, become the beneficiaries of human rights, it's, a lot of that is credit is going to go to you. Uh, one of the, the big problems, of course, are the, the hundreds and perhaps thousands of students, and not only students, but others, uh, that are being detained right now in prisons. Uh, who, are de who are deprived of all of their human rights, uh, but certainly those to immigrate and to move about freely, uh, as are almost all of the Chinese people, the whole one billion of them, and uh, uh, that is just deplorable. Uh, I, that is why I support both my bill, which cuts them off entirely, because I really do believe that that's the only thing that's going to get the attention of those old men in the, uh, in the government there now. Uh, we have to go back and trace the history of, of the uh, most favored nation treatment for China. Uh, in 1980, when this Congress uh, saw fit to, for the first time, uh, grant that, uh, that privilege, and it is a privilege uh, that we give, uh, we denied that to the Soviet Union. 
And every year since 1980, we have continued to renew Most Favored Nation Treatment for China. And we've seen the peaks and valleys, uh, up and down. We've seen them move uh, towards a market economy. And then we've seen them go back, uh, almost like a yo-yo. And uh, uh, then we saw Tiananmen Square happen uh, in 1989. Uh, and I believe it is because we continue to, to take the soft line with the People's Republic of China. If we had not played the China card the way we did back in 1980, if we had been tough with China as we were with the Soviet Union, I believe that today the people in the People's Republic of China would be free. And that is why I believe that we have to get their attention now, today. Uh, however, uh, since we may not have those votes in the, uh, in the other body, uh, I'm going to support your amendment to your bill uh, and hope that that is going to go to the president. We're going to do everything we can to override that veto because I believe that absent the, uh, the successful passage of my, my bill, that yours is the only hope for those people over there. Uh, not only that, but it's the only hope for people in this country. You talked about a $10 billion deficit today. That is the largest deficit that we have with any country in the world except Japan. And that deficit's going to grow by another $5 billion this coming year. That's not fair to the American working people. And we have to do something, so we have to be serious. And I, again, I just want to commend you for all you've done. And I hope we're going to be successful on the floor tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Billinson, any questions? Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nancy, you and I have for two years worked together as part of this uh, working group, and uh, we have uh, marched arm in arm to the Chinese embassy protesting human rights violations and clearly uh, you know that we have the exact same goal and that is to bring an end to the kinds of human rights violations, the uh, sale of, of weapon systems and a wide range of other concerns that exist on what I truly believe should be a government to government basis. And uh, that really is the thrust of uh, what what concerns me uh, about what we're trying to do here. And that is, uh, I think that our government should do everything that we possibly can to apply pressure on the reprehensible despots of China. At the same time, I don't believe that we should do anything that jeopardizes the livelihood of the Chinese people. And as I look at the litany of items that we, we have here, uh, Nancy, I, Every one of them uh, I, I am sympathetic with, um, and we've had these discussions before. But what I would ask is, do you know of other countries that um, do not meet the constraints as outlined in your measure uh, with which we now have non-discriminatory trade status? Mr. Dreyer, I would say that the point is not what other countries do we have a non-discriminatory trade relationship with, but what what is the standard that we hold other centralized economies to? And that's why I addressed earlier what the issue was with the Soviet Union. Because uh, in a centralized economy, the profit center is the government. And uh, that's why we have to deal with it differently than we deal with uh, non-market, uh, with market economies. So I, I think the point of reference, uh, the uh, comparison has to be with other centralized economies. And I think we're very, very tough on the Soviet Union, uh, rightly so, about insisting that they allow freedom of emigration from a centralized economy as our law uh, d uh, dictates. And also, not only that they, by practice, have uh, freedom of emigration, but that they codify the law. And you know that has held up renewal of most favored nation status for the Soviet Union until there was a codification of that law. And as you know, even having said that, by the time that comes to uh, Congress for uh, approval, that we will be obviously concerned about their treatment of uh, the Baltic states uh, and uh, other republics, people in other republics in the Soviet Union, and human rights there too. So, so I think that compared to the Soviet Soviet Union, China has been treated very leniently. And I think that is the only comparison that is relevant uh, rather than comparing it to uh, countries that have 
most favored nation, which are market economies. If we want to change our law to say we have MFN with anybody, and then that's another thing. But if, if, as long as we have laws that specifically relate to non-market economies as we do, I don't think that China, uh, the violations that China has uh, as far as human rights are concerned can be ignored. Nancy, one of the things that we have uh, done is, is herald the United Nations because of their activities over the past several months and working to put together this 28-nation coalition to deal with Saddam Hussein and all. And the United Nations has focused on human rights in a, a very mm -hmm. bold way. And it seems to me that uh, as we look at the fact that these actions would be unilateral, not multilateral, uh, it seems to me that, that maybe uh, looking to the United Nations uh, might be a better route for us to take rather than using uh, unilateral action here, and I wondered how you'd respond to that. Well, as I said, we didn't do that with the Soviet <laughs> Union. Uh, and many people say, oh, well, the Chinese government, uh, they don't understand about human rights, and you're talking about a different culture. Uh, but uh, all of the members of the United Nations are aware of the Declaration of Human Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about human rights. Sometimes when people hear the phrase, it sounds uh, fringe or marginal, but it's as basic as the basic freedoms that, uh, that uh, people in a democracy enjoy in terms of freedom of speech, uh, religion, and uh, uh, press and assembly. We're talking about basic freedoms. We're not talking about anything peripheral to their fundamental existence and, and how, they, uh, uh, how, how they as an individual are respected. So um, while other options may have been tried or are possible avenues, uh, and the president's, poli president's policy to date, it hasn't succeeded. Many people who support this bill this year did not support conditional renewal last year. They wanted out and out unconditional renewal. They have seen in this past year which was the second year since Tiananmen Square. No improvement, in fact, uh, increased repression, more arrests, longer periods of time for those who have spoken out peacefully for democracy. So the present, uh, op the present policy hasn't worked. That's why we're gaining more, even more support, even though we did have a good deal of support last year uh, for this, uh, even more support uh, from new quarters this year. Uh, and one other point I'd like to make while I'm on the subject, and I don't know if it was brought up, just as an example, you may recall that the Pope named a Chinese cardinal last month when he named the cardinals, a cardinal in exile in Connecticut. Uh, he's from China, but he lives in the United States now uh, because he, he could not stay there and practice his religion and tend to the flock. And in response to that naming of a Chinese cardinal, the Chinese government arrested a bishop, a Catholic bishop, arrested a, a Catholic bishop in China. This is a matter of a few weeks ago. Um, and so the repression does continue in terms of religion. The Catholic bishops have sent a letter uh, to Mr. Gibbons, uh, to Mr. Gibbons, for the record of his uh, hearing on Most Favored Nation of a couple of weeks ago, and they are sending the letter to the members of the Senate, uh, saying that uh, any renewal should have condition of improving the uh, religious uh, uh, freedom in the country and allowing uh, bishops to tend to the needs of their. Uh, um, flock, I guess, is the only word that comes to my mind. So the repression continues, and, the, and we have examples of it. If other options worked or were even tried, uh, maybe I wouldn't be making such a case for this, but I do think that uh, the present policy hasn't succeeded. Why not give it a chance? How much more would the Chinese government have to do to get people to say, we uh, agree to some conditions on the renewal. Would more people have to be killed? Would more tanks have to be used? More bishops arrested? How much more of a clue do we have to get that we have leverage because they like our market, they don't like capitalism, they don't like democracy, they do love money, they do need hard currency, they have it from us in the, it, in the uh, form of a, as much as $15 billion trade advantage this year. We therefore have leverage. I think we should uh, use it to see if we can't free the political prisoners. So I urge a modified closed rule so we don't make the conditions so onerous that none of us makes any progress, uh, but uh, um, a rule that, that calls for reasonable conditions uh, for renewal. And what, if I just say to Mr. Solomon, um, I, I think one advantage of going with my bill is that the more united the front behind a particular position, 
the stronger the message to the Chinese government, I think. And that's why, while I will intend to vote for your bill uh, tomorrow, and I commend you for your leadership in bringing it to the floor, the working group tried to, uh, to craft legislation that could get the broadest base of support and maybe even the acquiescence of the President of the United States to present a, a united front as far as China is concerned. I'll be the bad cop, you be the good cop. Mr. Chairman, I had about uh, six more questions, but I noticed that uh, my time has expired, and I would simply like to say that uh, you know, it, it seems to me that as we look at the horrible arrest of that bishop, that things today are still better than they were before there was economic association with the West. It, during the Cultural Revolution and, and, uh, and uh, prior to that, and uh, it's, it seems to me that as we look towards these goals, that there's no evidence that the Chinese government would respond in any way to the constraints that are outlined here. And uh, I hope very much that we'll be able to move ahead with uh, what will be unconditional approval here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to say to Mr. Dreyer that we look at trends. The trend was improving since uh, the Cultural Revolution, and now the trend is going in the other direction. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> I think Mr. Dreyer makes a very interesting point about the United Nations uh, doing more in this particular area. I think it's a good point. Uh, you know, the mandates of the United Nations were to do basically two things. One, to uphold the sovereign rights of nations, and number two, to uphold the human rights of the citizens of the world. And whenever those two issues have come into conflict, 99% uh, of the time they've always come down on the side of the sovereignty of the borders, the sovereignty of the nations, except in the point of uh, when it had to do with the, the Kurds, and they passed Resolution 688, which was a very interesting resolution, which is the first time that I can remember that the United Nations said that they would elevate the human rights of the people over the sovereign rights of the borders of the country. And I think the point is well taken. The Hunger Committee has really been pursuing this line of pushing this whole human rights, humanitarian needs above the sovereign rights of the nations. 688 is when the coalition forces came in there and delivered aid to the to the Kurds was a was a first time basis for the United Nations. They are getting a little bit stronger. Hopefully they need to get much stronger. It needs to come from us as, as congressmen, as a body, to speak to this because what happens in a situation like this with the most favored nation, our policy is so inconsistent from country to country. We've had a different policy with <coughs> Romania versus the USSR versus China. I mean, it's, a, it's absolutely ludicrous, and so we give the wrong kind of signals to these countries all over the world, and that's why these countries get... Um, you know, very disappointed with us. And uh, although this is a good policy and your amendment I agree with, I hope someday that uh, the United Nations, instead of us unilaterally doing these kinds of things, I hope that they can continue to do the kinds of things they've done with Resolution 688 and speak for the whole world rather than having to do it unilaterally. But it's a very good point that Mr. Dreyer uh, makes that the United Nations hopefully with urging from us and other Western nations is going to get stronger and stronger about the human needs of the individuals of the nations of the world rather than the sovereignty of the borders. Thank you. Mr. McEwen? Mr. Chairman, I just wish to commend uh, Mrs. Pelosi for her excellent statement and uh, express my frustration as to how we uh, draw some sort of different distinction and, and what a nation would have to do to not be considered qualified for most favored status that when young people that have the audacity to quote Lincoln and Jefferson and sit quietly uh, together in a town square are now run over by tanks, taken into kangaroo courts in which the gymnasium is filled with people chanting for their death as they stand there whipped and banged around and then taken out behind the gymnasium with have a bullet put to their head and drung in the next one, uh, shipping, sh shipping textiles to this country there that are produced by people under forced slave labor. I I'm at a loss to understand exactly what a person would have to do, what a nation would, must engage in in order to not be considered qualified for a most favored status. Uh, if you would think that they grease their tire tracks with the flesh of their own people, that would be sufficient, but evidently not. And so there is, uh, I think that somehow or another we've got to address this in a manner that, that uh, we value our principles and, uh, and not uh, whatever the, the 
uh, uh, rationalization is as to why America cannot stand for democracy, human rights, freedom, and that as such, then, uh, when you in, are in such dire access to markets, it's not like we're going to collapse if we don't have access to their slave labor. Uh, they're the ones that need to access to the international markets, and I think that asking them to not treat their people in that manner is not overly demanding on our part, and indeed I think it is a responsibility incumbent upon a free society to at least request it. Thank you. Be pleased to. Let me just, you know, I, I quoted the, uh, the New York Times article trying to show that this isn't a political thing one way or the other. But uh, in regard to what you just said, I mentioned back in 1980 when we established bilateral trade agreements, and the two basic premises there were that uh, uh, we would not discriminate against each other's imports and exports and that we would uh, not steal trademarks, copyrights, etc. This article starts off by saying that when a truck from China pulled into neighboring Portuguese enclave of Macau late last year, American officials happened to be on hand to take a peek at the cargo. They were surprised to find Chinese manufactured ski jackets bearing labels reading, Made in Macau, made by prisoners of conscience. It goes on to say that while all nations cheat on free trade to some degree, China is a socialist country that has put up barriers to imports so brazenly that if hardly makes a pretense advocating free trade. It goes on to say here, China is maintaining socialism while also learning some of the ways that exporters like Japan cause headaches for foreign uh, industrial countries. It says, uh, and then finally it says, to many, China's economy is a giant maze with dead ends at every corner and booby traps that lead to dense tangles of bureaucracy, and it goes on and on and on. The truth of the matter is, these, these are not legitimate people we're doing business with, and you have to treat them uh, <laughs> so. And your, your bill does it, so does mine. Let's go get them. Mr. Well, Gordon. I, I believe it's my time. Nancy, just briefly, you've been very um, <coughs> extremely tenacious and articulate in championing the uh, the human rights of, of China and I, the people in China, and I want to congratulate you for that, and also congratulate you for the care you've taken in crafting this very responsible uh, bill that I think, or amendment, that uh, will get action, and, and I, uh, you've done a good job, and you should be commended for that. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. I echo the words of Mr. Gordon. I think you've done an outstanding job. You have taken the lead in this, and uh, uh, you've put the coalition together, and one more I think you've done an admirable job. Oh, I was counting Mr. Solomon's time against Jaws, but Mr. McEwen. Just one quick question, Mr. Chairman. As, as I understand it, the United States President suggested most favored nation status in June of uh, 1989, and four days later, a uh, Tiananmen Square massacre took place as an act of overture. On our part, they re responded with their appreciation. Uh, that had been a year ago that some of you went to the Chinese embassy and were met by the chief of station there and re received warmly and expressed concern at that point. And then I understand that this year it was virtually impossible to get anyone and some deputy press person came down and took it and took the door, slammed the door. Uh, the progress that we're making in the response to them by giving us most favored, are giving most favored nation status, us not employing sanctions, us not making demands, uh, is this progress on their part? Are they warming it? I mean, do we, should we feel good now that at least they took our paper and didn't spit in the process? <laughs> or what, what action uh, do we, at what point do we say that this is not being effective? Well, I think that the policy has not worked, Mr. McHugh, and I, I think I agree with the spirit of your, uh, of your question, and that is that uh, some people have used the example, and the yeah. administration has, that, uh, that China uh, voted, supported us in the Persian Gulf, therefore they should get most favored nation status now. Well, to that again, I say the so Soviet Union voted with the United States and the UN. Uh, China abstained. The MFN is not there for the Soviet Union yet, and China's uh, president is requesting a renewal. I think that the point I made to the, uh, earlier that some of the people who wanted, who said, let's have another year of con unconditional renewal, 
are this year coming on board and saying they've had two years now, the situation has deteriorated, and in fact, there's a very strong arm. We won major on the floor with our amendments last year, thanks to this committee's giving us the ability to take them to the floor strictly on human rights issues. Since then, the arguments about uh, the economy that Mr. Solomon points out about, is it fair to American workers to have them compete with prison labor? Uh, is it um, uh, is it fair for American families to, to have to be concerned about the world becoming less safe because of the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which uh, China is now a party to? And in addition, uh, isn't it right for us to work, operate from principle? For economic, for strategic, and for reasons of principle, uh, I think that, that it's necessary for us to send a message to do anything less would to be to say that all that has transpired in the categories that have been mentioned here are irrelevant uh, to the fact that we just want to continue unconditional renewal. And I don't think that's what the American people want. I think our bill is a bill that the House wants. Many people were in on the crafting of it. All of those people care about um, China and don't want to hurt the people of China. We have reason to believe that these are conditions that are meetable, if there is such a word, and hopefully um, uh, that will, will have that opportunity. Thank you very much for coming yes, before the committee and allowing us to hear you uh, expound on this MFN. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the committee's your time. Your special order may be next up. You better get down there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. The all testimony having been taken, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule providing mm -hmm. one hour of general debate on the topic of MFN for China. With the time equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Ways and Means Committee, the rule waives all points of order against consideration of H.J. Res 263, H.R. 2212, and H.Con Res 174, the three measures under consideration. The rule makes an order to consider H.J. Res 263 in the House and provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by Mr. Solomon and Mr. Rostenkowski. Pursuant to the Trade Act of 1974, the rule does not provide a motion to recommit. Section 3 of the rule provides that expedited procedures for consideration of disapproval resolutions will not apply to any other resolution disapproving MFN for China for the remainder of the session. The rule then makes an order to consider H.R. 2212 in the House after disposition of H.J. Res 263. The rule provides two hours of debate equally divided and controlled by chairman and ranking minority member of Ways and Means. The rule orders the previous question on Ways and Means Committee amendments and provides for their consideration on block and not subject to a demand for division of the question. One motion to recommit H.R. 2212 is in order. In Section 5, the rule makes an order, it in order to consider H. Con Res 174 in the House after disposition of H.R. 2212. The rule provides one hour of debate with 30 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of Ways and Means and 30 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of Foreign Affairs. Finally, the rule orders the previous question on Foreign Affairs Committee amendments and provides for their consideration unblock and not subject to a demand for a division of the question. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina. Any discussion? What's <laughs> well, I'd be happy to Mr. if the Solomon. gentleman is serious. Mr. Chairman, I just make note that, uh, that uh, Billy Archer, the ranking Republican on Ways and Means, uh, had uh, notified us that he did not intend at this time to, uh, to offer a substitute. However, under the rule, uh, with our motion to recommit with instructions, he would be allowed to do that if he saw fit. And I thank you for that. Uh, the, um, as I had mentioned before, that uh, uh, Republican leader Michael had requested an open rule. And uh, if uh, I would make a motion uh, at the appropriate time to make that in order, and you have it all in front of you, and failing that, I would just have one other motion that would make a Miller Amendment uh, dealing with the Sullivan principles that are uh, presently in effect in, in South Africa be, a, be applied to the Pelosi bill. Um, and I would just do that at the appropriate time. And thank you for your consideration. This is the appropriate time. And I would so move my uh, my motion to make an order an open amendment, Mr. Or an open rule, Mr. Chairman. 
Confer the gentleman's motion on open rule. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. The amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, uh, expecting that, I would then offer the amendment, uh, the, the motion to make in order the Miller Amendment. You've heard and the so gentleman from New York's uh, motion on the Miller Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. The amendment is not adopted. Question now comes to the motion, Chairman. gentlemen. Mr. Dreyer. I uh, just wanted to clarify, you know, I've been making the point throughout the debate here about an additional hour on general debate, and I understand that you've put that hour now under the right. Pelosi right. Uh, provision, so that pretty well addresses the concern that we have. So the hour that we lost over the arch withdrawal That's of the That's why we did a few, David. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to take this time then to thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman, and your staff for taking care of our concerns. Okay. Question comes with the motion of the gentleman of South Carolina. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The rule will be handled by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Frost. Committee on Rules will stand adjourned. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> My pleasure. That concludes today's session of the House Rules Committee. Tomorrow, the House will debate the motion to disapprove the MFN status to China. C-SPAN will carry the floor consideration live beginning at noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific. Coming up next, coverage of today's session of the Joint Economic Committee. Good evening from the nation's capital, you're watching C-SPAN.